Great. <laughs> Hi, my name is Andrew Turley, and uh, I'm here to talk to you about an uncoordinated approach to scaling almost infinitely. Um, so first, I'd like to thank the folks at ScaleConf Columbia for letting me speak here and, and inviting me out here and flying me out and all that wonderful stuff. Uh, Vitahee's talk was great. I hope everybody paid attention. Um, <clears throat> her talk was a little bit about kind of getting things to work together. My talk's going to be a little more about how to avoid having things talk to each other unless they absolutely have to. So uh, I, I think I probably couldn't have asked for a better uh, person to speak before me because I, I, I hope that our talks are kind of good compliments to each other. Uh, so <clears throat> like I said, my name is Andrew Turley. Uh, I'm a software engineer at a company called Wallaroo Labs. We are currently building a distributed event processing framework that you can use to build uh, scalable distributed systems. And I'm Cassio Juarez on Twitter. Um, usually there's a few people who see that and get disappointed, uh, but that's me. Um, I've had about 20 years of professional computing, uh, writing code, I guess starting out at home and writing my own little programs all the way to where I am now, where I write slightly bigger programs for other people. Um, so, just a little bit of what to expect. Um, I'm going to talk today about coordinating work between computers. And the thing that I want you to remember is that coordinating work between computers is expensive. And really what we should be looking for is looking for ways to avoid having to do that if we can. Um, there's a very high cost to coordination. And so I'm going to go through some different approaches that you can use when you're building your own systems to help you avoid having to try to get computers to work together. Uh, even though I know we're all here thinking about distributed systems, and in theory that means kind of making them work together. So uh, the first thing I'm going to do is go over the problem a little bit and kind of talk about why we want to avoid coordination. And then I'm going to talk about two papers uh, that deal with ways of avoiding coordination. Uh, the first one is a paper called Life Beyond Distributed Transactions and Apostates View. It's a long title, I didn't put the whole thing in. Uh, and then the second one is Coordination Avoidance in Distributed Systems. And they both present slightly different approaches, again, to doing the same thing, which is uh, making sure that we don't have to coordinate work between computers, and computers can do work independently of each other in order to achieve uh, high performance. So first, let's just talk a little bit about systems design. Um, one of the things that we do when we design our systems is that we specify invariants for the legal states that the system can be in. Now, I, I know that a lot of us don't explicitly sit down and do that. We, we don't say, OK, here, here's a state, and here's the next state, and here's the next state. But that's effectively what our programs do. They are proofs of some sort that our system can go from one state to another. And if we've programmed things correctly, the set of legal states that we thought we were programming is actually the set of legal states that we did program. Uh, bugs are typically when we thought we had said a state was legal and it turned out not to be, or vice versa. And so, um, you know, at a very simple level, there are things like every user in our system has a unique ID, or an account balance must be positive, or every item in our system must have a price. These are examples of invariants. Um, so, we assume, generally, that our systems start in a correct state, and that any operation on the system must leave it in a correct state. So, we have our system, it's sitting there in some state, something happens to the system, the system transitions into a new state, and we assume that the starting state is valid and the next state is valid, or at least that's the situation that we want. Um, if only one operation at a time is allowed in the system, this is actually pretty simple to do, because we have one thing, it happens, it runs through our well-understood, hopefully, code path, and we get to the next state of the system. So it, in a situation where we only have one computer and only one thing happens at a time, not too bad. Um, if more than one operation is allowed at a time, we can use transactions to enforce the order that op of operations that might conflict with each other. And we can enforce, basically say, if something happened that violates one of these invariants, 
then we roll back the transaction. So a transaction is basically a way of saying, here's a whole unit of work, and it needs to be able to run in some way that leaves our system in a known state at the end. Or if that's not going to happen, then the transaction needs to fail, at which point we go back to another, uh, uh, the original state, which is a known state. And so transactions are kind of one of the ways that we can help enforce these invariants. And it also help, they also help us reason about our invariants and be able to say, okay, I've put this set of operations within a transaction, and so I know that they're all either going to happen or not happen. Um, so now as things get a little more interesting, if our application is spread across more than one computer and we need to keep them synchronized, then the transactions that we're talking about become distributed transactions. And so we start to encounter this situation where we are coordinating work across computers and saying, okay, you may do a little bit of work on one computer and a little bit of work on another computer, but at the end of the time when these two computers are working together and we're operating on this data, we need to make sure that we end up in, agreed, in, in a good state that we all agree on. And so when you hear about things like uh, Raft or Paxos or something like that, uh, th these are systems for what are called setting up distributed state machines. And so the idea is that your distributed systems are all kind of marching lockstep together to get from one state that they know about to another state that they both know about and agree about. Um, and so this could be a situation where you have uh, replicas of data and you need to make sure that all the replicas stay uh, in sync. Or it could be a situation where you have multiple computers that hold different pieces of the data that you need to work on during a transaction. So uh, basically, both of those situations, you'd need to coordinate your work. Um, so distributed transactions are nice, as I said, because they let you reason uh, about your system. Uh, they can kind of give you a unified system view so that you can see your entire distributed system really, you can kind of pretend like it's really just running on one computer. Uh, but there is a cost to distributed transactions. Um, basically, in a situation where you have them, uh, your systems need to communicate with each other to reach an agreement about what the next state should be. And as you add more computers to the system, the cost of this communication goes up. Um, and you can reason about this pretty easily. If you imagine a situation where you are on your own and you want to decide what movie to go see, it's pretty easy to make a choice and go see the movie. And maybe you'll regret it, but hopefully most of us are okay with our choices. Um, but as soon as you pick, pick a friend and you say, hey friend, let's go see a movie. Well, now you have to have a conversation about what movie you want to go see. And so it takes a little longer. And then you call three more friends. And you say, hey, we're going to go see a movie. And somebody says, oh, well, I've already seen that one. And somebody else says, I don't want to see that. I don't like westerns. And somebody else says, I only watch movies with cats. And now you're in a situation where you have to coordinate all of these things. And suddenly it takes a lot longer. And as I'm sure you've all experienced, things don't grow linearly. As, as you add one more person to this conversation, it doesn't become just a little harder. It actually becomes a lot harder because now all these different people have to talk to each other and all these different people have to agree. So that's effectively the, the situation that we run into when we try to coordinate distributed systems. Um, so if we can reduce the amount of coordination in the system, we can increase the system's performance. Instead of having to spend time with these computers coordinating work amongst each other and, and coming to some sort of agreement, the computers can actually do work for themselves. And in theory, that work that they have chosen to do is work that will be accepted by all the other computers. So, in a nutshell, that's the problem that we're, these two papers address and that we're going to be going over. So, uh, the first one is called Life Beyond Distributed Transactions and Apostates Opinion Position Paper. Long title. Uh, by a guy named Pat Helland, who was at Amazon when he first wrote the paper. This paper first appeared in 2007, and there was a republication in the communications of the ACM uh, I guess about a year ago now, 10-year uh, anniversary. And um, I didn't read it until it was republished. And it, I guess to give you a little background on it, it was kind of interesting for me because um, I've been working at a company and we've built a system that actually uses some ideas that are very similar to this. And so when I was reading the paper, I, I got really excited because I was like, wow, like we've kind of converged on this idea. 
And I showed it to my boss, and my boss was like, oh, wow, this, this is really cool. We converged on this idea. So it was a, a very exciting um, thing for us. It's a very, um, it, it's what I like to think of as kind of an engineer's or a practitioner's paper as, as opposed to a computer science paper. Uh, first of all, you can tell it's not a computer science paper because there are no citations at the end. Um, because why, why cite other work? Um, but it's also very much a, uh, a paper about practice. It's, it's really more a paper that describes things that uh, Helen has seen in the field and has described how he sees systems evolving and, and a uh, point towards, he which, towards which he sees them evolving. And so it's less of a paper that's you know, steeped in academics and telling you, oh, here's a theoretical thing you could do, and more of a paper that's saying, hey, you've probably built systems, you've probably built something that actually looks kind of like this, and here's kind of some, I, I don't even think he'd use the term best practices, although maybe he does, right? um, but here's, here's kind of me thinking a little bit about all these different systems and synthesizing what I've seen in them, and here's some things that you should probably think about if you're trying to build systems like this. So, um, as, I, as I said, uh, you've you got a distributed system, and so the idea in the paper is that you, you can take all of your state that you might have in one computer, and you can spread it across different computers. So in, in this case, he's talking about a situation where you've got multiple um, what he calls entities, and you're spreading them across a computer. And in this situation that he's talking about primarily, you're doing this because you don't have enough room on any one computer to store all of your records. So, you know, for example, if you are um, Amazon, let's say, and you want to store all your data, there's no way you're going to be able to fit it on one computer. So, um, so you'll end up building systems where you break that information up across these systems. Um, and so in the paper, he talks about basically taking distributed transactions, and instead of using distributed transactions, breaking up your uh, transactions into these fine-grained pieces of state that offer local serializability. And so the idea is instead of trying to make sure that all these pieces of state are coordinated together, you break them up in such a way that they can actually be updated and accessed and, and used independently of each other. Um, so as I said, these fine-grained uh, units of local serializability are called entities. And the data associated with each entity must be maintained completely independently from the data uh, for any other entity. Again, so that they can be accessed uh, completely independently from each other. So the idea is that anything you do to A really has no impact on what you do to D or E or B or C. Um, and entities must fit on a single computer uh, in order to ensure local serializability. So in this case, we've placed two, uh, two entities on computer two and three entities on computer one. But worst case scenario, one entity must exist on one computer. You can't break that single entity up across multiple computers. Um, entities may move from one computer to another. So, for example, in order to scale up an application, you might uh, go from having two computers to having five computers. And so, with these systems, the idea is that as you add more computers, your entities will migrate from one computer to another. And so, in this case, we've moved out across five different computers. Uh, he uses the term smearing in his uh, discussion, but the idea is that they're, they're kind of spreading out as you add more computers. And conversely, as you remove computers from the system, they can, the entities can move back to being on computers together. But part of the trick is that the entities don't know which computer they're on. They don't know which other entities exist on that computer. And so you, again, you, you write your system in a way that avoids coordinating between them, because you don't know, if you're A, you don't know that B is sitting right next to you necessarily. It may be, depending on the way your system started up, but later as your system's running, A and B may be on computers that are located, uh, you know, in different racks or in different availability zones, or, you know, one could be in Azure and one could be in AWS. Um, so basically, these independent pieces of state, these entities, uh, 
when they do need to communicate with each other, um, they communicate with each other through this web of interactions, and they basically do it through message passing. And so you can, again, this isn't about completely avoiding coordination between uh, entities. This is about avoiding co unnecessary coordination between pieces of your system. So each entity is uniquely defined in the system by a key. And the system uses that key to pass data from one entity to another. So uh, a message is basically a set of bytes that has a destination. So um, entity A can send a message to entity B. And the system is responsible for figuring out where entity B is so that it can pass the message from entity A. These messages are processed one at a time. Uh, so you can, basically you can model the processing of the messages as, uh, as a queue. Uh, uh, entity A sends a message to B, B puts it in its queue, and when B is ready to process the next message, um, it'll get to it and it'll process it. So a transaction in this sense uh, begins when the message is pulled off of the queue and passed to the processing part, and then the transaction ends when messages are sent out to the next entity or other entities. Uh, this actually makes it easier to reason about the system uh, by separating the processing of the message from sending the outgoing messages, because if you are the recipient of one of these outgoing messages, you're basically guaranteed that the transaction is completed. If the transaction doesn't complete, you don't send any messages out. So any of your downstream entities don't need to worry about figuring out if a transaction was only partially completed or something like that. So uh, here, here's a little bit of code to kind of illustrate what, what you'd have. You'd basically have what I'm calling the framework, which would get the next message from the queue, and then it would um, call a computation with the message and the state of the entity. And that's what we've got here in the business logic. So the business logic takes the message and the state, it takes the message, uses that to update the state, and then it returns some outgoing messages, which are then sent out by the framework. So the, the business logic never explicitly sends a message. It just returns message to the system saying, I have finished my transaction, and here's the messages that need to go out next. Um, so this is the wrong way to do it, this, the, just to kind of con contrast. Um, in a situation like this, this would be bad. Um, in this situation, we've got some updates to state, and then we send out a message, and we've got some more updates to our state, and then we send out another message, and then we update our state, and we send out another message. So in a situation like this, uh, the recipient for message one wouldn't have any idea whether or not these other state updates had taken place. And so your system could get into a state, or into a, a bad situation, where one of the downstream entities wouldn't know that the transaction hadn't completed. So again, basically this gives you a way of reasoning that if I've received a message, that means that my upstream uh, entity is in a valid state, in, in a new valid state. So uh, one of the things that you need to be concerned with in distributed systems and in systems like this is that messages can be delivered um, either at most or at least, uh, at most once or at least once. And some of you may be familiar with the differences between these, but I'll kind of go through it. Um, as you are figuring out how to handle messages in your system, if you're doing that most once, that basically means that you send out a message and you just assume that the recipient has received it, um, which can be kind of problematic because as I've uh, drawn in this diagram, there's potential that, one of the that the recipient has died and it may not receive that message and you really have no way of knowing that. Um, whereas with at least once, you send out a message and then you wait for the other, for the recipient to acknowledge that, that it's received and processed that message. And if you don't get that acknowledgement, then either after some timeout or something like that, you resend the message. Um, so again, with that most once, um, in a situation where one of our workers crashes, uh, we've got this message one going out, we process message one, message two goes out, we process message two, our process dies, 
So we miss message three, message four goes out and we process message four. So our uh, entity two wasn't able to process message three. It doesn't even know that message three existed. Um, and so in the at least once situation, uh, you can have a, a, a situation where a worker dies and because the receiving entity didn't send the acknowledgement, the sending worker just sends the message again, the worker receives it, and so you get, uh, even though the first entity sent two twice, entity two receives it once. Um, but worker two didn't necessarily, entity two didn't necessarily die, so there's a situation where you could, uh, for whatever reason, whether you were processing other things or, or your timer wasn't right, you had the wrong time, um, where entity two doesn't acknowledge message two. And so entity one sends that message again. And so now you've either got on entity two, you may, it may have gotten M1, M2, or it may have gotten M1, M2, M2. So it, it may have received a duplicate message. So your system needs to figure out a way to deal with this. Um, and, and I won't get too much into that other than to say that I'm sure if you've ever designed a system like this, you've seen a situation like this, and so this is something you need to talk about, or you need to think about as you're, you're building your system. Um, so the paper goes on to describe a, an architecture where basically your application is broken up into two parts. You've got a scale agnostic part, and you've got a scale aware part. And so the scale agnostic part is a part that can send messages out, but it doesn't care where the recipients for those messages are in your system. The scale aware part is the part that cares about that. So the scale aware part takes a message that it receives, figures out where the recipient for that message is within your distributed system, and then delivers that message. And we'll talk a little bit more about this architecture here. Um, so the scale aware layer knows how to route messages to entities. Um, so in order to do this, it needs to have some sort of way of looking up the location of an entity or you can use a system like consistent hashing or something like that where you know that if I have this a machine with this name, then the, the message goes to that machine. Um, the scale agnostic layer represents the entity state and the transactions that take place with, with the entity. It's not concerned with where the entities are located. And so this is that business logic that I showed you earlier. This is, this is where that would live. Um, it would be responsible for knowing how to uh, send from, or knowing what gets sent from one, to, one entity to the other, but not caring how it gets sent. Um, in the paper, Helen recommends, or I guess recommends may be the wrong word, he says that most systems also put the logic for handling duplicate messages in this layer. I'll talk a little bit about that in a minute and talk about some alternatives to that, but his advice is that you may not want to push that down into the lower layer. Um, and so he has this idea of an activity, and an activity is the linking of these two entities. It, it, in a, uh, an activity handles all of the information about the messages that are flowing from one entity to another. Um, so anyway, the, the, thing, the nice thing about a system that's built on these principles is that it can scale almost infinitely. Because you're not coordinating work between entities unless you absolutely have to, you don't face any, you, you don't have a lot of overhead of transactional costs, you're not waiting while four machines agree on one thing to happen. You don't have that situation that we talked about with the movies uh, where you're trying to get everybody to agree to something. And so basically what that means is that you can throw more machines at your problem and you can scale linearly. Um, so entities are completely transactionally isolated from each other. So the only cost to scaling is routing the messages from one entity to another. Uh, again, in contrast to distributed transactions where every time you add a new node to the cluster, uh, the, the system becomes slower overall. So um, I'm running a little low on time. I'm gonna s skip ahead a little bit. Um, yeah, so basically the, the parts of the system that are described are the entities, the activities, the scale aware layer, the scale agnostic layer, and I don't know why I stuck in key there, sorry. Uh, let me just talk for a second about my experience building systems like this. So um, first of all, 
uh, systems like this are really amenable to an, an actor model. And if you're not familiar with the actor model, uh, I'd recommend you take a look at languages like Erlang or Pony or uh, frameworks like Akka or the C++ actor framework. Um, the other thing that I'd say is, like I said, in Helen's um, description, activities were part of the scale agnostic layer, and that was something that the scale agnostic layer needed to be concerned about. Uh, in my experience, you can actually push activities down into the scale aware layer, or at least, or even better, just have activities kind of be their own layer and let your system um, worry about re message redelivery and connecting to other entities and kind of remove the application developer, uh, relieve them of the burden of that. Um, and so what will often happen is you won't have entities just kind of interacting willy-nilly. You'll have a very well-defined relationship between those entities that you can set up usually as a graph ahead of time. And so you can, you, your framework for running the system basically knows about which entities are going to need to talk to each other. And the, app, the uh, person writing the application logic doesn't actually have to explicitly write that. They can just say, pass it on to the next step as I defined it in my graph. Um, and yeah, so uh, most applications consist of known types of entities that are communicating in very well-defined ways. So it's, it's again, it's, it's not a free-for-all wild west of entities all just doing whatever they want. Uh, most systems are going to be very well-defined and uh, easy to reason about. So the other paper that I want to talk about is uh, coordination, avoidance, and distributed systems. And I'm gonna go a little quickly on this. Um, so the paper's main contribution to the world is this idea of invariant confluence, or what they call I-confluence. And what it means is that coordination can only be avoided if all local commit decisions are valid. Um, so if it's a system in this paper, they're thinking about a system that contains one or more replicas of data. So you might have replicas spread out across your distributed system, either to uh, increase availability so that your clients can connect to different systems and still see uh, replicated data, or you may do it for um, being able to fail over if one of the systems fails, you've got a replica living somewhere else. Whatever the reason, you've, you've got replicated state. And so um, these replicas are updated independently and uh, result in valid state. So in order for something to achieve that I confluence I talked about, this is one of the conditions that you need to meet. You need to be able to update the replicas independently um, and have those updates result in a valid state. So you've got two different machines. Uh, you start out with the same S. Update one comes to one machine. Update two comes to the other one. So now you, you're in one of your uh, machines is in state two and one of them is in state three. And then uh, in order to be I-confluent, the final thing that you need is a merge function that guarantees that if those two states are merged together, that they result in a single new valid state. So if you meet these uh, two conditions, if the replicas can be updated independently uh, and result in valid states, and if there's a merge function which exists which can combine these two states into valid states, then you have what, what they call invariant confluence. Um, invariant confluence deals with operations, not with the entire system. So you wouldn't say that an entire system is invariant confluent. You would say that certain operations within the system are invariant confluent. And what that means is that if you, um, if they are invariant confluent, then they can be executed without coordination. So that means, that, as we showed, you can update two states and you'll have a system that's still in a valid state. And then at some later point, you can coordinate between them and, and you can uh, merge the data together and end up in a valid state. But you can put that off for kind of indefinitely, depending on what your invariants are. So um, one thing the paper talks about is that sometimes subtle changes uh, to your invariants can change something that looked like it was non-I-confluent uh, in, into something that is I-confluent. And so one example that they give is um, that invariant we talked about a while ago, new users to a system must have a unique ID. So if we assume that we've got two replicas and, and we can add a new user to each one, um, if we assume that our IDs have to be monotonically increasing, they have to go one, two, three, four, you could imagine a situation where we have two machines that have four users, or we've got a system that has four users, and then we tell each of our replicas, create a new user. 
So they each add one, and now you've got a new user called Mary and a new user called Jake that both have the same um, system ID. And so in this case, if we merged those two, we'd end up in an invalid state because new users would not have um, unique IDs. And so this, a situation like this where you, your invariant was that each individual has to have a unique ID and it has to be monotonic, that would require coordination between the two machines to make sure you didn't duplicate IDs. But if you change the invariant slightly and you say that we, can, we don't have to have monotonically increasing IDs, we can have um, a replica name appended to those IDs, well, suddenly you have a situation where each of your replicas produces IDs that are unique to that replica, and when they're merged, the merge is globally unique. And so in that case, the merge is valid, and so you have an iConfluent situation. And so what that means is that by slightly changing the invariant, by slightly changing the design of our system, we've gone from something that requires coordination to something that, requir that doesn't require coordination, which means that now we've created a system that is more scalable. So part of the trick is looking for situations like this in your design and in your invariants, where you can go from something that needs to coordinate and will be slow to something that doesn't need coordination that can happen faster across distributed systems. So again, uh, specify your invariants, take those invariants and look for iConfluent uh, operations, and use those iConfluent operations to figure out where you can avoid coordination. Uh, real quick, I'll mention that there's been research into things like this. If you've ever heard of uh, CRDTs, um, these are data types with merge functions that guarantee valid states. And so um, there's been a lot of research into using CRDTs for data stores that allow you to have highly available distributed data stores that, where you can update things on, on different replicas and you can merge them and still have valid data in your systems. Um, you can't do this for all data structures. There are specific data structures and specific operations that will make specific guarantees about this. But if you can fit your system into CRDTs, then you can actually scale much more easily. So uh, conclusion, don't coordinate unless you absolutely have to. Uh, take a look at these two papers for ways to do that. Um, I think I'm out of time here, so thank you, and thank you all. <laughs>